Our first speaker is Siobhan McKeown. She's WordPress expert hailing all the way from northeast of England with over a decade of experience. Today, she will guide us through finding ideal clients, adding value in sales, and mastering the enterprise sales journey. Let's welcome Siobhan McKeown. Hello. <laughs> oh, it's very loud. Hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the keynote. Uh, and thank you all for coming and for being here. I'm just going to adjust this a little bit so I can't hear myself so much. Um, and thanks just for coming to my presentation. I've really enjoyed being in Taipei. I've never been here before. It's been wonderful. I've eaten a lot of food. It's been great. My favorite thing to do. Um, so this was my original talk title, how to catch and retain a WordPress enterprise client. But when I started to get into it, I realized that actually there were so many talks packed into this statement that I've cut it back a little bit. So I'm actually just going to focus on how to catch a WordPress enterprise client. Um, just the sales process itself takes up the length of a talk. Um, and actually, as I've been going through it, even different components of the sales process could take up whole talks. Uh, so, but if you want to talk to me about how you retain clients or anything to do with this, feel free to come and chat to me through the WordCamp. So a little bit about me. Uh, I've been involved with WordPress for about 13 years. I used to be the rep for the docs team. I was one of the founding members of WordCamp Europe. This is uh, me and my friend Hanny after the very first regional WordCamp, WordCamp Europe in 2013. And all of the organizers will appreciate this feeling of just lying on the ground and done feeling like we did it and we are exhausted. Um, so these days I'm the COO of HumanMade. Uh, HumanMade is an enterprise WordPress agency. Uh, we also have a cloud hosting platform, Altus, where we offer enterprise hosting to banks, to universities, to media organizations, among others. And just to begin, uh, I just thought it would be fun to look back at where HumanMade started. Hello, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed the keynote, and uh, Noel's uh, talk was great. Um, so we all have to start somewhere. This is the first version of the Human Made website that we could find on the Wayback Machine. At that point, Human Made was one word. We've got a very nice carousel there. I don't think the telephone number works, but if you want to give it a try, feel free to. Maybe Joe or Noel or Tom will pick it up. Um, and also, we're not just UK-based, having gone remote in 2013. But something that we still do, I'm going to have to read it because I can't see it on my notes, is we love building fantastic things for fantastic people. And if you want to do something with WordPress, speak to us. We can make it happen. Um, so here are some of HumanMade's very first websites. Um, I could only find very, very poorly cropped versions of these in our WP Media Library from way back in the day as evidence of the work. We've got Ardman animation. We've got awkward family photos. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Uh, Digital trends, geek.com. And they very, look very dated now. Um, but these are kind of the early versions of what we were doing at Human Mid. But this is what we're doing today. We work for big organizations, for enterprise, for companies like Siemens, Google, with Yale, TechCrunch, uh, Red Bull Media House, banks, universities. We've just launched a new site for Harvard. Um, and we've come a really long way since that. But it's step by step, and you know, we've all got to start somewhere. We all at HumanMade love to share, uh, and I think this is one of the differentiators of HumanMade, is that we're made of open source contributors. We have so many open source contributors as part of our leadership, as part of our staff, and we really love to share. So we share our staff handbook, we share our engineering handbook, and we also love to share how we approach things. And that's what I'm going to do in this presentation, is talk a little bit more about how we do things as a business. So what I'd like to do with this presentation is to help some of you catch your first whale. 
So to do that, I'm going to tell you a story. And we're going to see what we learn along the way. The story is going to take you along the sales funnel. Um, we'll cover it in broad strokes. And as I said at the start, when I was putting this presentation together, I was like, this could be its own talk, and this could be its own talk, and this could be its own talk. Um, so at the end of the presentation, I have going to share a QR code. Uh, if you follow it, it will take you to your blog post, and it's got um, links to what I think are good resources about different stages of the sales funnel. Um, so funnel is a really good representation of the activity because it follows a journey from creating awareness cl to closing a deal. And a really common way of phrasing, framing this is called ADA. Thanks to Petra for helping me make this uh, diagram <laughs> yesterday. Uh, so it starts with awareness. What is it? Just creating awareness of your product or service. Interest. I like it. That's generating interest. Desire. I want it. At this stage, your prospect is uh, motivated to engage with you and wants to, to more interest in buying what you've got. Uh, and uh, action, which is, I'm, I will have this. So I'm going to take you on a story. This is Joy. She looks a bit like me. Uh, I got some help from my designer. I'm very lucky to get some help with my slides. Um, I'm probably much more snarky and sarcastic than joyful, just to, to put that out there. Uh, <laughs> Ryan's very sarky and sna sarcastic laughing at me. Um, so Joy was a web developer. Not like me. I was never a web developer. I was involved in WordPress in other ways. Um, she did a bunch of freelance work, building websites for small businesses. Those businesses got a little bit bigger. Um, then she got more work than she could do herself. So she asked some friends to join her. Just a few other developers at first. Then another developer. Then the designer joined her team. Then a project manager. And before she knew it, Joy was no longer doing any development herself. She was running a business. Oh, this is not in a language I understand. <laughs> uh, so Joy has got a problem. Joy's engineers are looking for more challenging work. They're really sick of building brochure websites and customizing themes. They've seen that other engineers are doing much more interesting work with WordPress. They're using the block editor to streamline organizational workflows. They're integrating other tools using the REST API, building complex integrations, building like really customized uh, front ends. And one by first one leaves, then another. They love working with Joy. Like everybody loves working with Joy. She's happy all the time. But they want to grow, which means Joy's business needs to grow too. Not only that, but Joy herself is ambitious. She wants to grow her business. She wants to have bigger challenges, to learn more. She'd like to get some stable income. And she's heard that when she gets her foot in the door at one of those big organizations, that she'll keep getting work from them. So chapter one, how do you get that foot in the door? So how is she going to get an enterprise client, first of all, if she doesn't even know what, what type of enterprise she wants to work with? Enterprise is a big word, contains a lot within it. So you've got to really think. She, Joy needs to think, what is my ideal client? Joy isn't really sure what her ideal client is. At this stage, she really, really would like to work with anybody. Anybody who's going to give her money, great. However, there are some things she does know. She knows that one of her engineers previously worked at a university in their digital services department. And they've been doing like themes and customizations for some schools. This means education could be a pretty good industry fit. She knows that she'll need to work with a big university that is profitable. So she needs to look at the intersection of her team's expertise with technology fit, ability to buy, and geography. So this is creating an, an ideal client profile. 
Um, oh, I started with one bullet point, but not the others. Oh, that's making me cringe. <laughs> so, uh, when you come up with your ICP, think about the following. Industry, is it an industry you're familiar with? Think outside of the block box, not just clients you've had, it might be industries that your team has worked within and that has experience of. Size of the company, a good indication of the overall revenue and the complexity of, is a, uh, a good, good indication of the overall revenue and complexity of the organization. Although when you're looking at the company size, remember that you'll just be working with one team within it. A company could be huge, like a bank, for example, but it's, you know, they have things like bank tellers uh, and people like work, working within their high street branches. So there's all sorts of like different types of roles within those organizations. Potential budget. So you won't know the budget that all of these organizations have offhand, but you can project what size of budget is ideal for you. Your costs and your team. Is it $50,000, $20,000, a million dollars? And then geography. Are there geographical regions which you are better suited to work within? Have you got a team there that can work? Factors might be things like whether your team's located there, whether you have, uh, whether you speak the language, uh, and the sort of purchasing power uh, within that locale. And then finally, business goals. So, what are the ideal business goals? Could it be? Would it be digital transformation? Could it be moving on to new platforms? Could it be speed and performance? There's lots of different goals that actually you could be well suited to work within. So once you've got your ideal client, you need to go and find them. Um, so Joy realizes she doesn't really know anyone who works at an enterprise organization. She loves going to WordCamps. We all love going to WordCamps. WordCamps are great and meeting WordPressers. But enterprises don't really go to WordCamps. And in our experience at HumanMade, it's very rare for us to like, be doing client meetings or, or meeting new clients at WordCamps. And I think this quote from Seneca is really, really helpful and instructive when thinking about you know, how you can position your business to grow. Uh, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So you need a combination of preparation and opportunity. Through defining her ICP and understanding what her team can offer, Joy is prepared to talk about the value her team can bring. And then the opportunity is just putting yourself into the right types of situations where you might encounter people who are interested in what it is that you have to sell. So this means going where she knows they will be. So she searches for conferences and events focused on digital marketing for universities. There's some local events that connect her into the local community. Bigger ones where, if she's honest, she, she does feel a bit overwhelmed. But she puts herself out of her comfort zone and she starts speaking to people. She has a go at speaking at a local meetup. And when she builds up her confidence, she speaks, up, uh, speaks at a one-day tech event focused on people who work in digital marketing at universities. <coughs> she starts to write posts on LinkedIn about innovations in WordPress, specifically in education settings. She shares useful plugins that people in digital at a university might want to use. She comments on case studies and other people's posts. She broadens her social media network and just generally gets herself out there. At all times, she's trying to bring value to people through the interactions that she's having and demonstrate her expertise. Her team, like the team at HumanMade, her team doesn't exist, so I've had to use HumanMade's team as an example, um, are WordPress contributors. So she posts about that and shares their contributions. And in terms of our experience at HumanMade, having um, so many people at human be, be contributors to WordPress, be vocal within WordPress, take leadership roles within WordPress, in the WordPress community, has had a huge impact on human mid's business. And that's not why we all started contributing. We started contributing because we care about uh, open source. We care about uh, democratizing publishing. Um, but these are definite fringe benefits uh, to us as a company. So I highly recommend that you think about your contrib contributing strategy. Then one day, she gets an email from Jeff. He works in digital marketing for a business school, 
at a university. He has an RFP that he'd like to send her, if, if she's interested. Of course, she is. Chapter two, a journey of discovery. So Joy needs to learn about this prospect, and if she has a good discovery process, it will help her to make sure that she can craft her pitch to the prospect. So this is thinking about how you understand the prospect, how you understand their business deed. It's also an opportunity to demonstrate professionalism. Throughout this discovery process, you want to really not just like learn about them, but you need to deliver value to them. Every touch point with a the prospect, they should come away feeling enriched and feeling good about the experience of having that interaction with you. So, first of all, she has a discovery call in this hypothetical story, which goes the wrong way. In this, when it goes wrong, Joy hasn't done her research, and she doesn't know anything about the organization or the stakeholder. This means she could waste time on pointless questions that she could have found out elsewhere. Um, she also wastes a lot of time talking about her and the prospect's shared love of dogs. I love dogs. I've got a Labradoodle. She's very cute. You can look her up on Instagram, and I love her. But spending 10 minutes of a 45-minute sales call talking about your dogs is kind of wasting yours and their time. Um, she also doesn't spend time digging into the problems that, the, that Jeff has. For example, Joy asks, what's your biggest pain point? Jeff says, our site is really slow right now. She doesn't ask what problems this causes the team or the business. She just goes on to ask, how big is your team? However, Joy doesn't do that. Before the call, she does her research. She finds out that Jeff has got a boss called Susie, who is the person who will make the final decision. Jeff is just the person doing all of the research. Um, she's gone to LinkedIn to find out Jeff's role and his position in the organization. He finds out that they're hiring two new members of staff, which means that they are a team that's growing, which is a great thing to know. It means that they likely have budget. She finds out that he leads a team of four in Singapore, and they're going to hire two new team members. She opens the call with a warm but brief opening, in which she expresses her appreciation for the person for Jeff. She checks in on time, asks if 45 minutes still works for you, and she outlines the end goal of the call to understand their business goals and how they can work together. This is, uh, if, you, if you're in sales or curious of sales, you will find that, that there are a lot of acronyms for everything. This is a, a, a little process called ACE, A, appreciation, C, check-in, and E, end goal. Uh, in the post that I'll share at the end, there's lots of acronyms. Um, oh, I have lost my notes for this. Um, so, whenever... Uh, Joy asks Jeff, what are your pain points? Jeff says, our site is slow. Uh, and he, she says, what are the problems that that causes for you? And he said, well, our ad revenue is going down because uh, people aren't staying on the site, people are bouncing on the site. And he also says, but it's also causing problems for our editorial team. There's a lot of inefficiency because we're waiting for things to load all of the time. Um, so she understands that they're losing their revenue and they want to improve on their efficiencies. So she's got a good idea of the change that they need to create within the organization. So now that she has everything she needs, she can go away and put together the estimate and the pitch. Um, she has the request for proposals that's been sent to other agencies. I don't know how many of you have re received these, but often they're huge. Uh, they're massive documents that you have to respond to. But she has got her discovery call, which gives her information that other agencies don't have access to. She knows exactly what the business goals are. She knows how her team can help Jeff achieve those goals. As well as the art of responding to the RFP, Joy has to estimate how much the project will cost. So work on this scale is new to Joy. 
And while they can easily estimate how much a brochure site will cost, a migration with new editorial workflows, a full performance audit, and optimizations, and a refresh of the front end, that's a whole new thing. They've never estimated anything like this before. Um, so they're going to get it wrong. They are going to underestimate what it's going to cost. Uh, it's going to you know, ultimately cost them money. But every time they estimate, they're going to get better. Estimation is really hard. I've shared some posts about it. Um, there are things that Joy could have done. Uh, she could have got access to WP admins. So their engineers could have had a proper look around. She could have asked for access to the code base. Some uh, prospects will do that. She could have built in a discovery phase so that they could better determine the full scope of development, so just sell that discovery with the phase two, which is actually the build. She could build in contingency by adding a multiplier on top of her estimate. But she doesn't do any of these things. She gets it wrong. <laughs> uh, she also has to think about pricing mo models. There are loads of different pricing models uh, you could adopt. Joy continues with her hourly based pricing model, which is what a lot of agencies do. You can do daily. Uh, that's human made charges by the day. You can do value based. You can do project based. You can do sprint based. Lots of different ways that you can figure out how much things are going to cost. But she breaks the project down into stages, and she, she and her team break those down further into specific tasks to figure out how long each task will take and then how much it will cost. Um, there might be situations, and this isn't one that Joy is thinking about because she doesn't know yet, that you might intentionally price low. It could be your first project. You want to get the logo on your website. It might be, uh, and this is an approach that we've taken, is that you want to land and expand, which is that there is a, a small opportunity at a really big organization, and you want to get your foot in the door so that you can deliver really well and you know that that organization is going to have loads more money uh, to send your way. Uh, so but in that situation, you need to be realistic about what it's going to cost you and also what the future opportunities are. So Joy is delighted when she's invited to pitch because she's done so much prep work already um, through the RFP and the discovery. She feels really ready to answer any questions that are thrown at her. And you know, when you go into a pitch, if you've done your prep work, it's actually pretty easy because you, you know it all inside out. And it's really just going in, having that conversation, uh, delivering value, making people feel educated by that process. So they distill the RFP down to a 15-slide deck. They tell the story of how Joy and Jeff's team are going to work together. She paints this beautiful picture of collaboration. And Jeff thinks this is wonderful. So. This is not the time within a pitch to focus on how great you are. And I think this is a mistake that people make. You, know, you establish that through the RFP response is your own credibility. You want to focus on what the prospect's future, how they will be different and better by working with you. You want them to see that and feel that through the pitch. So off it goes. So, done the pitch, got the RFP, enjoy wits a few days. And then she was a few more days. And then a few more days. And what Joy doesn't know is that Jeff's boss's mother is sick. And suddenly she had to take three weeks off work. And that turned out and that when she returned, her boss said that the budget needs to be approved by their board. And the board is struggling to get it approved because they have an off-site followed by an all-hands. And then when the board does review it, they have a bunch of feedback. That gets sent back to Jeff. And Jeff has to take it to IT. And IT is like, why are you even using WordPress anyway? Oh, we've got a phone call. That's fine. Um, and then he has to make a whole business case again to IT, the IT department, who begrudgingly say, fine, it can go ahead but only on this side over there, and we don't want any responsibility for it. And then it goes back to the board, and they can only arrange a meeting in two weeks, which they do, and it gets signed off, finally, and Jeff finally, finally emails Joy six weeks after they last spoke. 
And I can tell you, in enterprise sales processes, this happens all of the time. The amount of times that we have like, done a pitch, then got an email saying, oh, we've got to hire someone new before we can go ahead, or it just goes completely silent, and then three months later, someone messages you. This is part of enterprise sales, is patience. She almost given up. She was sad because uh, the leader looked so promising. But what Joy will learn is that and the process is that enterprise sales is a marathon, not a race. Um, any touch point that you have with a big organization is not just a contact with one individual. It's a point of contact with all of the complexities of that organization. Whoever you speak to has a boss, and they have a boss, and they have a boss, and they have a board, and your stakeholder is managing the demands of multiple departments and opinions. So things take a really long time, and things can be very challenging for your stakeholder. So, but she gets an email from Jeff saying, you're the preferred vendor. Yay, good for joy. But the story doesn't end there. The stakeholder might be happy, but it's not the end of the story. There are some monsters to overcome before the project is in the bag, and these can tank a project. So you might get the email saying, yes, we love you, we really want to work with you, it's going to be great, I can see our future together, but it's not over, and you need to prepare for these. First monster is procurement. Procurement is a team that determines whether a vendor is going to be safe, secure, and deliver the best value. They will always look for ways to drive down costs and mitigate risk. And they decide whether an organization can work with a vendor or not. They go hand in hand with compliance. The compliance team will make you assess, will assess you to see if there are any risk factors associated with working with you. So Joy has sent an enormous 300 question, question, uh, 300 question questionnaire where she's asked about security awareness training, and endpoint security, and network conf configuration, and encryption, and development environment security, and data handling, and all of these things that she just doesn't normally have to think about when she's doing these uh, you know, smaller, uh, small to medium sized sites. In the end, Joy gets through it all. The compliance team decides that Joy security, it's not up to scratch. So they tell the stakeholder, they tell Jeff, if, that, if they really want to work with Joy, they'll have to send laptops to the team to work with. And this happens, <laughs> which they do. They send them, and now it's finally time for the contract where they account for their next monster, legal. So you're going to send off, or Joy sends off her master services agreement and waits two weeks while it gets stuck in the legal department. Eventually, when it comes back, it is covered with red lines. The legal team has pulled out, of the claw, out their claws and being able to use the uh, project and marketing activity. It's disputing the payment terms, the jurisdiction where any disagreements will be mediated. They have no clue about the GPL, so all reference like open source is completely uh, written all over. And Joy feels completely out of her depth. At this point, she brings in a lawyer who helps her navigate this whole situation. Um, of course, she has to spend time finding a lawyer who is within her budget, so that adds another few weeks onto the whole thing. But she finds someone, they understand her organization, they understand the GPL, not many people do, um, and they work through the red lines. And finally, finally, she wins the, uh, she wins the, uh, oh, where am I looking at the wrong one? Then the work begins. Yes! <laughs> uh, so my time's up, so I'm going to run through the last bit really quickly, and uh, maybe I'll be able to take photos of them. <laughs> so the work begins. She hands uh, the work over from sales into delivery, a whole talk that many people from Human Made could come and give, I'm sure. Um, she's got some top tips, which I'm going to fly through, um, but I'll share the slides. Um, he now that Joy's a pro, she starts speaking at events, she comes to WordCamps to share her knowledge, to get more people selling to enterprise, and here's what she tells you. 
Enterprises are big, multi-department organizations. You will work with one small part of a big organization, and you won't have anything to do with the rest. They won't know who you are. WordPress is often the secondary CMS, uh, which integrates really broadly with a broader tech stack. It's very integration heavy. Um, you're going to be very need, need to be very clear about how you handle data, how you secure your environments uh, and your computers, and how you vet your people. There are lots of decision stakeholders and decision makers, which is exhausting and difficult to navigate. Um, so some of her tips, am I on the right one? Yeah. Network widely, share your knowledge, do this. Go to other events, don't just go to WordCamps, go to open source events and go to events where your ICP will be. Understand the business value of WordPress and open source. Another talk in itself there, I would love to give that talk. But why should the prospect buy WordPress when there's so many other options out there that have huge marketing teams, Sitecore and Adobe and all of those things, uh, they could buy those. Uh, land and expand. Start small, get your foot in the door, uh, maybe even under price, although make sure that you're very confident in doing that before you do it uh, to get your foot in the door. Learn the organization chart and build relationships with all of your stakeholders. So you'll have the person who gets in touch with you, but you should be drawing a map of all of the people who are related to them. Start to understand how that organization works. Um, ask the right questions to understand the prospect business goals. It's, they're, they're, you know, they're not just buying a web website, they're looking to implement a change, and you're gonna help them create that change. Uh, uh, be patient. The enterprise sales process cycle is very long. Uh, sometimes it's very short, always great, sometimes very long. Um, be persistent, follow up. Don't let them forget about you. You're still there. Um, Petch, you've worded this for me, I thought it was great. So you may have caught a whale, but you still need to get it on the boat. And the compliance, procurement, and legal can completely really scupper your deal. And I can tell you that's happened to us, and that is really gutting when you've put months into a sales process for something like compliance to bring it to an end. Engage a lawyer who understands your business. I've worked with a lot of lawyers. A lot of them don't understand your business. You need to get someone who works for you, how you do things, your values, understands open source. Get ahead of compliance expectations. The main things that enterprises care about are how you handle data, are your computers and development environments secure, and are you vetting your team? And that's especially important if you're working with freelancers and contractors and if your team is remote. Remember the funnel, the activity needs to ha happen throughout at each level, and that's it. I'm done. On, uh, before I finish, I just want to give a shout out. We've got an enterprise panel on Sunday, Saturday at 1 in the main track. We've got Lorna Lim from Human Made, Kim Cole from Yoast, and Raul Bansel from RT Camp, and they'll be talking to Petya Rykowska about how WordPress can better serve the needs of enterprise, and you'll get more great insights on enterprise there. So thank you, everybody. If you've got any questions, I think maybe a bit of time, maybe not. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much, Avon. This is such a great talk. Now we are open for question for five minutes. Okay. Siobhan, actually I have a question for you. Great. What makes a great client? Ah, that's a good question. What makes a great client? Um, somebody who's communicative, who will engage properly with the process, uh, someone who understands your delivery process. I'd say one of the challenges that comes up at Human Made is that we, we use Scrum for delivery, and you know sometimes we don't have like a really engaged product owner on the client side. That can lead to challenges within the, pro within the process because they are kind of waiting for the end of the process for the thing to happen, but we need them engaged throughout. Uh, we do have a, a really great client uh, and this is, makes a really good client, is that every time she's left an organization, she's re-engaged us at, a new, or her, at her new job. I think we've been through like four different companies with her. Uh, so that's a really good sign of a great client. It's somebody who takes you with them. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, 
So when you have a large project, how do you typically break up milestones for payments and delivery? Yeah, sort of, so we, we usually, we have a roadmap which is drawn up at the, be the beginning of the, uh, the project, because we use Scrum, then we're working with the product owner to deliver in sprints every two weeks. Um, and we tend to like then stage the payments dependent on the project. It's usually like 30 day terms or whatever. Uh, so it will depend on the deliverables, it will depend on the project, you know, smaller ones. Uh, will be related to the actual launch, but other ones will be dependent on deliverables. Okay, thank you. We've got one here. There. Such a wonderful talk. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. So my question is, most of the time the decision makers at Enterprise uh, does not understand the technical talks. Yes. So they're maybe having issue with the uh, site speed, mm -hmm. and this is why bounce rate is going up. Mm -hmm. And whenever I'm going to tell them this is happening, they, mm, I don't understand that. Yeah, yeah. So how do you overcome that situation, actually? <sighs> That's a good question. I mean, we whenever we are... I guess working with the stakeholders, we like we have a great team of engineers who are good at like getting that balance between uh, the technical stuff, but also communicating that well to the client. Um, you know, you can do like uh, you know page tests and stuff to show them. You know, uh, so the Google one that shows your like uh, site speed and actually just showing them things like that. Um, you know, you can share articles with them. I mean, ideally ones that aren't too technical. Uh, about the relationship between like speed, site performance, and bounce rate. Um, but really, you know, it comes back to what I was saying through the presentation: is like you can educate that person, and you can you can help them to understand. You know, it's yes, some of the technical stuff might be difficult, but actually, the conceptually, if you can get them to understand that, then they've learned something through their interaction with you, which is really valuable to them. Thank you. <laughs> So one of the questions I had that, like, how do you um, explain to the uh, the customer that the project might take a little longer than they estimate? Because oftentimes stakeholders have a, a timeline in mind, mm -hmm. but the scope of the project is actually larger than what yeah. they have in mind. So how do you how, how do you reconcile that? Because you realize it's going to take longer, yeah. but they don't. Yeah, I mean, this comes back to what I was saying about the engaged product owner. If you've got a product owner on the client side or any stakeholder who's fully engaged in helping you make decisions mm -hmm. throughout, then they should, like, it should never come as a surprise to them. There should be enough a part of the process that really they should be seeing that coming as well. Um, what we aim for at Human Made is there's three sort of vectors for a project. There's scope, there's time, and there's um, scope, time, and budget. And usually one of those is going to have to give. So if you're running up on a deadline and that's not going to, uh, you're not going to hit it, so you've got to de-scope something or they're going to have to add another engineer, which increases the budget. And if the, uh, if the stakeholder has been really part of the project, then they will understand the need for that. So you really need a good accounts team to manage those types of situations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siobhan. Um, I'm pretty sure if anyone have questions, um, feel free to uh, meet Siobhan uh, at the conference later today. Um, thank you again. On behalf of WordCamp Asia, we would like to give you this thank you gift. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.